Okay, it is seven o'clock, so we will begin uh, the program. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for this live streamed presentation, Journey to the Center of Our Galaxy with Rick Wallace. I'm Joyce Guzik, and I'm with the Parito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And I will be the moderator for today's talk. And as you've heard or see, tonight's talk is being recorded. We are able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors. So uh, by way of introduction uh, to Dr. Rick Wallace, um, he has a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of California in Santa Cruz. He worked as a staff member at Los Alamos National Laboratory for 30 years working on physics simulations. His hobbies include nature photography and astronomy education. Okay, so I think um, that's all of my introduction. So I'm going to turn it over to Rick. Um, and welcome to everyone. Uh, let me uh, start by uh, mentioning that uh, I, uh, we're talking about the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And there's been some new imagery that has come out just in the last month. And what I wanted to do was go through that imagery and uh, highlight some of the things that you can see in those images. Now, there have been other images showing um, higher resolution or more detail in some of these individual uh, objects, and I'll show some of that as well. Uh, but this overall image gives you an interesting view of the um, uh, the, the center, central region of our Milky Way galaxy. So uh, before we do that, though, uh, I would like to first mention something that's coming up just next week, and that is the Perseid meteor shower. August 11th, 12th, um, the evening of the 11th, the morning of the 12th, uh, you might be able to see a few meteors just before midnight, but in fact, most of the meteors um, are uh, will be visible between two and four in the morning. The best way to see these is to find a dark site, uh, maybe sit in a lawn chair facing sort of toward the southeast, um, wear warm clothing, and watch for at least an hour uh, because these things don't appear instantly. Uh, you, this is a, a fairly well-known meteor shower. You could see as many as 50 meteors an hour, depending on how dark the sky is uh, where you're watching from. Uh, and this particular um, shower is known for larger chunks of material entering the atmosphere with really bright flares. Now, the way this works is that the Earth passes through um, the orbital debris of Comet Swift-Tuttle uh, after it has passed, and it uh, has a period of about 133 years. Um, the, uh, it sheds material as it approaches the sun and warms up and the sort of dirty ice chunks begin to fall off. It has a particularly large um, uh, coma, uh, more than coma, uh, core. Uh, and so some relatively larger chunks can be left behind by this comet. And that leads to the somewhat larger um, um, fireballs, uh, or sometimes called bolides of meteors that kind of uh, explode in the sky. This diagram shows the orbit of Comet Swift-Tuttle um, passing through our solar system uh, inner planets. And then here's the orbit of the Earth in green, um, and or bluish green. And that orbit of the Earth intersects the um, former path of the comet and then goes through the material uh, of the comet's trail. Um, as I mentioned, it produces more fireballs than any other meteor showers. The particle velocity of these particles hitting the Earth's atmosphere is about 60 kilometers per second. So um, let's go on to the main topic of this evening, and that is this image that you see of the center of the Milky Way. Now, before we start talking about what you can see within this image and highlight some of the details, I first need to talk a little bit about some of the physics processes that um, we will be seeing 
uh, illustrated by this image. So we're going to back up for just a few minutes and start talking about some basic physics. And I think to give you a little bit uh, larger screen on some of your devices, if I turn my video off, you, that might be a little less distracting. So here is a bar magnet you're probably familiar with, has a north and a south pole. And uh, for a permanent bar magnet, uh, if you sprinkle iron filings around it, uh, the iron is drawn to the magnetic field lines and you can see the field lines mapped out uh, around this bar magnet. Now the Earth, uh, for various reasons, kind of acts like a bar magnet to some extent. It has a North Pole and a South Pole. And the North Magnetic Pole is not exactly aligned with the geographic North Pole, that is the rotational axis of the Earth. They're somewhat offset. Um, but you can see that the magnetic field lines are actually look somewhat like that bar magnet that you saw before. They form these large loops, um, moving larger and larger as they go out. And as they go out, they're a little bit weaker uh, than the ones uh, nearby. The Earth's magnetic field is actually relatively weak, uh, but it still has a large effect on life on the Earth. And we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, discussing how the Earth's magnetic field is generated, because that would be an entire hour long talk by itself. Uh, so rather than do that, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some of the mechanisms involved. And you'll keep hearing about these mechanisms as we then move to the sun and then we move to the galaxy as a whole. So the Earth's mantle is convective. It transfers heat to the surface by blobs of material heated down by the core here and then uh, rising as blobs up toward the surface. And they cool as they rise um, and then uh, circulate and fall back down again to be reheated by the core. That's called convective cooling. And you'll notice that this is a radial motion. It is a motion away from the core directly toward the surface. Um, at the same time, uh, the sun is, I mean, the earth, excuse me, is rotating. So the core and the mantle and so on are all rotating, right, once every 24 hours. So you have this rotational um, motion and perpendicular to that rotational motion, you have the radial motion or the convection. And those two motions interact to form what we call a dynamo. Now, the dynamo effect is perhaps more um, familiar to you if you think of uh, a permanent magnet, and like the north-south magnet, horseshoe magnets here, uh, and some kind of rotating conductor inside. As that conductor rotates, the magnetic field, which is tied, electromagnetic field, this, the magnetism is tied to the current the, of the charges. And a conductor that's rotating, uh, this magnetic field will induce a current in the conductor, uh, motion of the electrons in the conductor, and that current can then be um, extracted from this mechanism and uh, used to produce electricity. So that's the way generators work if you have um, a coal-fired power plant or nuclear power plant, oil-fired power plant. All they do is produce heat, which then uh, boils water, and that steam is used to turn uh, the blades on a turbine. And uh, the, as that turbine rotates, it's the equivalent of this mechanical shaft here uh, rotating, and it rotates a conductor through a magnetic field, and that generates current, and that current then uh, goes into your house to power things like Zoom presentations and computers and iPads and things like that. So um, another uh, use for this might be if you have a bicycle that has an automatic headlight on it so that when you're pedaling, there is uh, some contact with one of your um, wheels in such a way that um, it's turning a little mechanical device with a magnet in it that is generating just enough current to light up your headlight. And when you stop pedaling, the current goes away and the headlight goes off. So um, this is this, the same basic idea of these um, solar or planetary dynamos. They're just a little more complicated in the case of the sun or the earth. So in the earth, we have um, this uh, 
rotation around an axis, which causes uh, the spiraling motion of the uh, convective cells. And these uh, interact in such a way to magnify any inherent magnetism um, and uh, amplify and produce the Earth's magnetic field. And if you look at a detailed uh, computer simulation of the generation of the Earth's magnetic field, it's really a mess. You see all sorts of tangled field lines, all sorts of things going on. And that's why we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Just the idea, though, is that is this dynamo effect of you having um, conductive material, so you can have uh, electrons and uh, protons freely flowing, especially electrons. Uh, you have a conductive material that's in some kind of mechanical motion, um, and it involves a magnetic field, which amplifies that field. Um, now, in the case of the Earth, you can see the magnetic field lines are concentrated on the at the poles. And so if we have external particles, charged particles from the sun, for example, that are funneled by these electric field lines toward the poles, you end up with something like the auroras. You have charged par particles funneled onto the pole by the Earth's magnetic field. The molecules in the Earth's atmosphere are ionized by these charged particles from the sun. And then they glow by fluorescence along the magnetic field lines. Um, the molecules, the, the uh, electrons, outer electrons in these molecules are uh, bumped up to an excited state. And then as they recombine or um, lose their energy and fall back down again, they emit fluorescence at a color that is characteristic of that material. And so oxygen tends to produce green fluorescence. Uh, the blue and red comes from nitrogen in our atmosphere. So that's the way it works on the Earth. It's actually a, a kind of a similar thing that happens on the sun. Uh, you remember that the sun has these large solar flares, prominences, um, explosions of plasma off the surface of the sun. And here's a little uh, insert of the approximate size of the Earth to give you an idea of how large some of these loops can be. They can be many times larger than the Earth. It's a tremendous amount of power that is produced in these solar flares and somehow pushing this material off the surface. So let me show you a video of what that looks like. Well, okay. Do it this old fashioned way. Now you should be able to see um, that loop being thrown off into space. Now that has uh, is related to the sunspots, the bright areas. Um, they are um, uh, related to sunspots. Um, and what happens is that um, there are magnetic field lines that are getting twisted up. And as those magnetic field lines break and recombine, it throws this plasma out into space. Um, this is uh, from a satellite that has a disk that covers up the, the center of the sun so that um, you're looking at it from some distance and the sun itself is covered and you can see the material being thrown out uh, away from the sun. Let me get back to that disk photo again. There you go. You see that material being thrown out. Okay. Now, um, this is a coronal mass ejection, a fairly strong plasma wave. I'll show you a little bit of a uh, little more information. You see all of the structure on the surface of the sun, too. These are, remember, um, those uh, convective cells in the Earth. Well, we have the convective cells in the sun. There's many more of them. And they're fairly large, but there, there are a lot of them. And that produces the granularity structure that you see on the sun itself, in addition to these uh, big magnetic disturbances. A fury is building on the surface of the sun. Jets of super hot gas Towering waves of fire. The most violent explosions in our solar system.
Science is now taking us on an extraordinary journey into our star. To explore the power and rising threat of solar superstorms. Now this is a, an hour long video that you can get on YouTube called Solar Superstorms, uh, which goes into uh, more of the details of how these um, magnetic fields are formed within the sun and what happens as they get to the surface and then uh, get twisted and break and reconnect uh, to throw this material into space uh, that then travels all the way to the Earth and the other planets. Uh, we believe that uh, this is effect of this material being thrown off the sun is what may have uh, blown away the atmosphere, original atmosphere on Mars, for example. Okay, uh, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the solar dynamo effects. I'll just mention some of the effects that are um, uh, related to producing these magnetic fields on the sun. The sun has differential rotation. That means the equator rotates, um, makes one rotation faster or at a different rate than um, the northern and southern hemisphere. So uh, a magnetic field line, think of a magnetic field like, like this one that looks like the magnetic field lines from the Earth with this large loop. But in this case, uh, is because of the rotation, it's getting wrapped up on itself and really tangled up. This is called the omega effect. The magnetic field lines wrapped up by this differential rotation of the, of the sun. Now the alpha effect is the twisting. You can see the local twisting of these magnetic field lines by this rotation acting on flux tubes. Flux tubes, remember, that's the convection tubes coming up from the, uh, from in the interior of the sun. Um, and so we have the omega effect, the alpha effect, and then we have a meridional flow, which is related to the 11-year sunspot cycle, where on the surface of the sun, you have uh, material flowing from the equator toward the poles, and that's why uh, during the uh, sunspot cycle, you'll see sunspots uh, forming near the equator and moving toward the poles. Um, this is slow. This is around 40 miles per hour, and the sun is huge. Remember, you can, you can put uh, uh, 1.3 million Earths inside the sun, so uh, the sun is, is really big, so it takes a long time to get to, from the equator to the pole at 40 miles an hour. And then um, it goes, uh, this flow is uh, submerged and there's a return flow just underneath the surface of the sun. And that's even slower, that's two to four miles per hour. And that's related to the sunspot cycle. So all of these three things uh, come together to form these twisted magnetic field lines on the surface of the sun. And their net result is you have these coronal mass ejections and um, uh, material being blown out to form the corona of the sun, heats the material in the corona, which is this outer glowing envelope that you can see during a solar eclipse, total solar eclipse, and then it moves these particles on toward the Earth and the other planets. The plasma is mostly electrons and positrons, few alpha particles, traveling at something like 2.3 million miles per hour, so they're really thrown out there. And when they get to the Earth, uh, the Earth's magnetic field inter intercepts these particles and funnels it around the Earth, maybe toward the poles and gets some of it entrained, <coughs> excuse me, in the Earth's magnetic field. And this disrupts radio signals, cell phones, GPS signals, that type of thing. This is a close up around the Earth of this solar wind coming in. You can see it being funneled by the Earth's magnetic field into the um, solar the polar cusps of the magnetic field and funnel down toward the surface of the earth where they produce the auroras. Some of the material gets trapped uh, in the area near the earth uh, known as the Van Allen radiation belts. Um, and some of it is deflected, a lot, a, a large amount of it is deflected uh, around the earth by the earth's magnetic field. Um, for whatever reason, which we could talk about, but again, that's another program, Mars does not have a magnetic field, so these particles were not um, uh, deflected around Mars. They uh, 
sputtered into the atmosphere and caused the atmosphere to keep, be blown away. Okay, so let's move from uh, magnets and then the earth and then the sun. Now we're going to talk about bigger things. A little bit different um, physics going on here. We'll get back to magnetic fields in a moment. But first, supernova explosions. Now, we've talked about supernova explosions many times. Uh, many of you are familiar with those. Uh, this uh, image is the Crab Nebula. It's a remnant of a star whose explosion was witnessed by the Chinese uh, on the Earth in 1054 AD. Uh, and there is a small remnant uh, left in uh, the center of this called the neutron star. So the supernova recycles processed gas from stars back into the interstellar medium. Just very quickly, you know that the uh, most of the material originally is hydrogen uh, and helium. Large amount is two thirds of it is uh, three quarters is hydrogen. So when a star forms um, from a huge gas and dust cloud, um, that hydrogen uh, is compressed in the center of the star until it heats up, becomes very dense and starts undergoing nuclear fusion. The hydrogen is fused into helium nuclei. Then the helium um, eventually uh, is fused into other elements. And this continues until uh, you build up uh, sodium, magnesium, neon, and so on, uh, all the way up through iron. Iron does not give off energy when uh, uh, through fusion. And so when the core of the star becomes mostly iron, um, it can no longer hold itself up against the collapse of gravity and the star collapses. When the star collapses, the um, outer inner portions of the star continue to collapse depending on the mass of the star and the outer portions, uh, some are blown away immediately, others uh, collapse, uh, bounce off of this core and explode into space as a supernova explosion. So uh, what's left behind? Well, a star the size of our sun doesn't actually create a supernova explosion. It's just not massive enough to collapse in such an extreme way. A star that is maybe 10 times the size of our, uh, or several times more massive than our sun, um, when it collapses, will develop a neutron star. And even more massive stars, when they collapse, uh, will form uh, black holes that uh, the material collapses until um, the electrons uh, are pushed into the nuclei, combined with the protons to form neutrons. Um, if that's enough for the mass of the star to hold it up, you have a neutron star. If it's not enough, if the mass of the star is too great, then even those are crushed into a black hole. We've, um, you know, black holes again are a whole nother topic. Um, so we'll just mention that they uh, can result, among other things, from the collapse of a very massive star after a supernova explosion. But the remnant I want to talk about tonight is the neutron star. The neutron star is very dense nuclear matter. Uh, something about um, you know, the size of the sun or several times the size of the sun collapses into something that's about 12 to 15 miles in diameter. That's the size of a city, New York, Manhattan, Vancouver, you know, 12 to 15 miles is really small, considering that you have a good chunk of the mass of a star um, there. Uh, in fact, you have about uh, one to two solar masses. Uh, remember, our sun started out so big you could put one million Earths into it. And now imagine that, or something a little bit larger than that, collapsed into something the size of 12 to 15 miles in diameter because atoms have a lot of space. And when the electrons are orbiting a long way from the nuclei of the atoms, those electrons are crushed into the uh, center, into the core of the atom, into the nucleus, and uh, combine with the protons to become neutrons. Now, that's the broad um, brush. A tablespoon of material uh, from this neutron star would weigh over a billion, with a B, tons. The crust of a neutron star, we believe, uh, may be about one to two kilometers thick, and that has ions, nuclei, uh, mostly um, iron nickel, um, uh, maybe uh, an iron nickel lattice uh, with electrons flowing through it. So it has nuclei, electrons, a lot of neutrons. And then beneath this um, very thin crust, you have a, a neutron proton Fermi liquid that basically think of it as essentially neutrons. 
the inner core may even be a quark gluon plasma, but we don't have a lot of uh, understanding of that yet. But when the outer layers of the neutron star uh, are blown off, or the, the star that's collapsing is blown off in the supernova explosion, there will be some of the inner portions um, that after the neutron star collapses, this stuff will continue to accrete onto the neutron star. And because it's rotating, you know how an ice skater who uh, pulls in their arms will rotate faster. So as the neutron star uh, material collapses, it rotates faster and faster and faster. And uh, until it's spinning um, so fast um, that the, um, it has a huge velocity at its surface. And this is, its gravity is dragging this other material as it collapses um, with it. And so you form an accretion disk. The poles collapse because they're not supported by this rotational pressure uh, into a disk, a flat disk, more or less flat disk. Um, and this material then slowly accretes from the inner portion of this disk onto the neutron star. Some of it may accrete so fast that it can't uh, fall onto the neutron star and remain there it spirals onto the neutron star and has spit out the poles as a jet. And you can see the jet um, through here. And this jet seems to be uh, formed by a combination of the strong hydrodynamic inflow from the inner surface of this accretion disk and magnetic fields, funneling this accretion into the neutron star poles, which causes the beams of material to be ejected from the poles. Now, magnetic fields do something similar to uh, rotation. Uh, there is conservation of angular momentum, which causes the star to rotate faster as it collapses. Uh, there's a conservation of the magnetic fields in such a way that the magnetic field becomes stronger and stronger as it's trapped in this extremely dense uh, plasma, ionized plasma material um, that is collapsing into the neutron star. So the neutron star magnetic fields uh, are amplified a great deal as well. This is a schematic of a pulsar where you have a rotation axis that it may not be aligned with the magnetic field axis. So charged particles emanating from the neutron star are accelerated along the magnetic poles, swept past the observer as the star rotates, and we see these magnetic poles come into view. And that's shown by this diagram on the right, where you don't see the poles, and all of a sudden you see the pole, and you get a flash of light. Those are called pulsars. The rotation rate of the neutron star can be 43,000 revolutions per minute, giving the surface speed of about one quarter the speed of light. That's not unusual for these neutron stars. Um, okay, let's move on. So neutron stars have extremely strong magnetic fields and they affect the area around them. Now, um, this is an image produced from uh, the Chandra X-ray data, Chandra X-ray satellite. Um, X-rays don't penetrate our atmosphere, so they have to be observed outside of our atmosphere by satellites. Um, and the Chandra uh, X-ray observatory does that. Uh, and optical data. So we take the optical data where you get some of the colors, combine it with the Chandra data, which is mostly shown here in blue. Um, and uh, the um, X-ray uh, information comes from electrons, radiation from electrons that are wound around the magnetic field lines coming up from this uh, neutron star, the pulsar in the Crab Nebula. Um, and their acceleration of these electrons creates synchrotron X-ray radiation. But all of this blue is this X-ray radiation superimposed on the um, optical data from this pulsar, neutron star, rotating neutron star. Now, magnetars are just amplified, zipped up neutron stars. They are neutron stars with magnetic fields that are thousands of times stronger than even the normal magnetic fields of a neutron star, which are typically very strong. Uh, some of these magnetic fields are a quadrillion times stronger than that of the Earth. The magnetic fields stir up charged particles near the neutron star, and that magnetism is so strong that it can dominate processes on that surface of the neutron star. Remember, there was a little bit of crust on that surface. 
um, even over the outrageous gravity that that service is experiencing. Magnetar flares can emit charged particles for thousands of light years. There was one in 2004 that compressed the Earth's magnetic field from a distance of 50,000 light years away. These are believed to be the source of fast radio bursts, some extremely energetic radio bursts that just come out in a very quick single pulse. Some uh, magnetic field strengthened by, well, um, the, we don't have a complete explanation, but it might appear, and here's a, a flare from a magnetar, um, uh, it may appear that um, super flares from these magnetars are millisecond uh, and also millisecond gamma ray bursts and fast radio bursts may be caused by the magnetic fields generating star quake, quakes in the thin iron nickel crust. The closest known magnetar, uh, this is one of these souped up neutron stars with a super magnetic field, um, is about 8,000 light years away. And it was just measured this year, actually. So moving on a little bit from neutron stars, we're going to switch gears yet again and talk about highly sensitive radio telescopes like the VLA in southern New Mexico near Socorro that have found magnetic fields around galaxies. The VLA was upgraded in 2021, which gives it the sensitivity to actually see radio waves from galactic halos. Oops, come on. There we go. And that's what this would look like. These are um, galactic magnetic fields that are a million times weaker than the Earth's magnetic field. Remember, you had extremely strong magnetic fields from um, neutron stars stronger magnetic fields from uh, magnetars, a certain type of neutron star. Um, but now we have millions of times weaker than the Earth's magnetic field from these galactic magnetic fields, which is why it requires such sensitive radio telescopes. So this is um, a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope uh, in uh, uh, visual light, um, superimposed on the magnetic field lines that were obtained from polarization observations of the radio waves that come from electrons in a galaxy, this particular galaxy, NGC 5775, the electrons um, are spiraling around the magnetic field lines. When they do that, their acceleration creates um, radiation, uh, and we can see the radio radi uh, radiation, polarized radiation, and it traces out the magnetic field structure around the galaxy, just like those iron filings would show the magnetic field structure around a bar magnet. Here's a close up um, for NGC 4666. This is a galaxy that's 86 million light years away. Um, and these streamers go out 22,000 light years from the disk. Okay, and here are magnetic field lines from 4217. Uh, this is a galaxy that's about 67 million light years away. So how does, this, how does this happen? One popular theory that explains the magnetic fields inside a galaxy's disk is called the galactic dynamo. Remember, we had the Earth's dynamo. You have dynamo generators for bicycles. You have a solar dynamo generating the sun's magnetic field. And now we have a galactic dynamo. Uh, this theory describes how an internal to the galaxy dynamo creates magnetic fields by a fluid-like motion, rotation, and convection, remember words you've heard before on the Earth and the Sun, both, rotation of the galaxy and convection in hot gas so that the kinetic energy, energy due to the motion, converts into magnetic energy. This dynamo may be fueled by supernova explosions, infalling gas, and magnetars may create asymmetries, uh, little hot spots within the overall field. And uh, this is analogous to how rotating molten metal in the conducting core of the Earth uh, works with convection to produce the Earth's magnetic field. Now, let's start looking specifically at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. 
in our Milky Way galaxy, um, we've recently been able to uh, have access to this photo. Uh, Sophia is an infrared, uh, it's actually an airplane that's flying, flown by NASA with a huge infrared telescope on it, tries to get up above much of the Earth's atmosphere, um, but uh, it flies it with an airplane instead of uh, completely exiting the atmosphere like a satellite would. Um, and it has, uh, this is an infrared photo of dust grains that align perpendicular to the magnetic field lines in the center of the Milky Way. So the magnetic pressure is greater than the thermal pressure created by the gas in the region, and it may be able to control matter in a way that's similar to the way the solar corona is produced, that glowing part of the sun that you can see during a solar eclipse that's way beyond the surface of the sun, uh, may be similar mechanisms. In the solar corona, magnetic field pressure is greater than the thermal pressure on the surface of the sun, allowing the formation of sunspots, loops, um, coronal mass ejections, other magnetic anomalies. So maybe a similar thing is happening here. Uh, this could explain a few things. For example, the star formation rate near the center of our galaxy of the Milky Way is lower than we might expect. There's a lot of material there, gas, dust, a whole bunch of stuff, but not as many new stars forming as there are farther out in the disk, more closer to where we are, two thirds of the way out on the disk of the galaxy. Um, well, why is that? It could be um, inhibition by these magnetic fields. Um, it also might explain why the black hole in our the center of our galaxy is quieter than expected. So remember, the center of our galaxy uh, has a black hole. Its name is Sagittarius A star, and it is um, a black hole that is 4 million times the mass of our own sun. Not exactly clear how it formed. There are several theories about that. 4 million times the mass of our sun. That's a huge black hole, and that it seems to be a black hole pretty much in the center of almost every, every galaxy out there. Um, huge, supermassive black holes, some of them a billion times the mass of our sun. Some of those black holes are accreting material all around them and uh, shooting them off into jets where we get things like quasars and, and very energetic galactic nuclei. Um, our sun is actually relatively quiet. Uh, it has a few bursts, but not very many uh, flare ups, uh, radiation, no jets coming out of it. Is that perhaps related to the structure of the magnetic field lines that happen to be uh, structured in a certain way in the center of our Milky Way? And um, there are also some cold molecular clouds that is uh, molecular hydrogen, not ionized hydrogen, floating around in the central region of our galaxy. Well, how can you do that when it's so hot and there's so much energy of stuff whipping around because it's orbiting that black hole? Well, again, magnetic field might help explain some of this. This is an example of a flare, an X-ray flare from the Milky Way, the central black hole in the Milky Way. Um, so this is an, an infrared image actually with a um, the X-ray image superimposed on it and then blown up so that you can see it. Uh, the flares occasionally erupt from this central black hole, Sagittarius A star, and we'll talk about what causes that in a second. Uh, but these are milder than in many other galaxies. So what causes this flare? Well, we've actually seen an example of something like this. Uh, there um, is a black hole 250 million light years away that was um, observed by the European Southern Observatory uh, just a few months ago this year uh, as, any, as a certain event, AT 2019 QIZ, in a spiral galaxy in, um, in uh, the constellation of Eridanus at a distance of 215 million light years. So this is another galaxy, we've changed subjects on you slightly. 250 million, 15 million light years away. Um, and this is a black hole where a star got a little too close to that black hole, was pulled into the black hole and spaghettified. Remember when we talk about black holes, we talk about how if you start to approach a black hole, the gravitational uh, field of a black hole is so strong that if you were to jump toward a black hole with your feet toward the black hole, your feet would be pulled um, by a, the black hole's gravity 
much more strongly, perhaps a thousand times more strongly than your head. And you would be stretched out into a thin line before all your molecules broke apart and things like that. But um, that's called spaghettification, extending you out into that line. Well, the same thing happens to a star. So these folks observed this event with the ESO, and um, they then uh, produced a artist's rendition of what the data was telling them was happening. So what you're about to see is a video that is an artist representation of the data collected by the spaghettification of this star by a black hole. Whoa, I'm gonna do it this way. So you have a star about the size of our sun, a solar mass star being shredded by a million mass black hole. And that outflow that you see in those jets reached uh, 10,000 kilometers per second. So that's what happens if a star gets too close to a black hole. And this is what causes the flares, We maybe not a star, but maybe it's a gas cloud with less material in it, gets too close to the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And it causes the flares that you saw in the previous uh, view graph. Uh, now, just to orient you, uh, orient you a little bit toward our, to our Milky Way galaxy, if you're not so familiar with the Milky Way, uh, this is another galaxy, NGC 7318, that is a barred spiral. So this is what we believe our galaxy looks like. We observe the stars that are out there, where they're located, uh, their velocities, their motions, and we make a map of that. And that map uh, of our Milky Way looks very much like the image that we see of this particular galaxy and, and many others, actually. But we have a central bulge, a lot of concentration of stars here. Uh, black hole in the center, um, and then these spiral arms out here wrapping around um, the galaxy, and the galaxy is rotating. Our sun would be about here, so about half to two-thirds of the way out from the disk, 25,000 um, light years from the center of, whoops, I'm looking at the wrong diagram. Our star would be about maybe here, halfway to two-thirds of the way out, 25,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And it rotates, this whole structure rotates, uh, and our sun rotates around the Milky Way galaxy uh, back to its starting location about once every 250 million years. So this whole galaxy is rotating and you have all these hot things causing heating, um, supernova explosions, um, black holes, accretion disks, neutron stars, magnetars, all the stuff, heating up gas and dust in the galaxy that is then rotating and you have turbulence and rotation and ionized material, conducting material, and that leads to magnetic fields. Um, now we're going to th keep, keep in mind this view of the um, Milky Way. We're gonna rotate so that we're looking edge on to this. If we do that, uh, and we look toward up in the sky toward the constellation of Sagittarius. Some of you may know Sagittarius has this asterism or formation of stars in the center of it that looks like a bit like a teapot. And these are outlined in red for you on this diagram so you can kind of see the uh, Sagittarius teapot. And it looks like the Milky Way looks like steam coming out of this teapot. Um, Sagittari um, yeah, Sagittarius a star, and it's called Sagittarius A because it's this big thing um, in the center of our galaxy in the direction of the constellation of Sagittarius as seen from the Earth. Uh, but there was already a Sagittarius A that was something else. So when they discovered the black hole, they called it A with an asterisk at the top, so an A star. So, uh, and that's about, about here. Now it's hard, to, you, you can't see it in the visible because there's this huge giant um, black cloud of dust uh, intervening between us and the center of the Milky Way. So in fact, it doesn't look as bright as you might think. You can see the brightness here, uh, but the very center doesn't look as bright as it does in this because we're looking from the side and looking through a huge amount of dust uh, between us and the center of the Milky Way. So you have these big dust clouds. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this 
uh, structure, this disc-like structure that's diagonal in this photo um, photograph. This is actually a photo of the sky. And we're going to rotate that diagonal so it's just horizontal along our screen. And if we do that rotation, um, we see again uh, the center. And this is now showing the full extent. It's a um, 360 degree view of the Milky Way, the sky at night, just unwrapped so that you can uh, see it on a flat screen. Um, and the center here is where Sagittarius A star is, the center of our galaxy, the black hole. And this is invisible light. But you see all of these dust um, lanes. You really can't see too much into the center of the galaxy. But the dust um, has a very specific effect on light depending on the wavelength or frequency of that light. It turns out it's very good, the dust grains are very good at blocking visible light, but they are not very good at blocking infrared light. So if we use an infrared sensor to look at the center of the Milky Way, here is a very much similar picture. The horizontal structure of the disk of the Milky Way and now we can see right into the center of the Milky Way uh, where that um, central region of the black hole is located. And you can see how bright that center is in the infrared. So what these clever folks did a few months ago is to make a composite picture. They zoomed in on the center of the Milky Way. You saw the, this bright area here. So they're kind of looking at this area right here for the center. Um, and they use Chandra X-ray data. Uh, and they, so X-rays are also not um, absorbed very uh, strongly by the dust. Uh, so they're looking at the X-rays coming from that part of the central part of the Milky Way, along with the radio uh, energy, radio waves. And we're seeing a bunch of hot regions uh, from supernova explosions, outbursts of material heated by the black hole, gas clouds pushed around by massive star clusters, maybe magnetars, uh, and accretion disks around black holes and neutron stars. First thing I want to do is switch to the internet and show you this website. This is the NASA Chandra uh, satellite um, website where uh, this image came from. I'm going to first look at radio. So this is the image in the radio. And you can see these structures. Some of them look rather linear, actually, right? And then you see these blobs here, as well as these blobs of material that don't look quite like um, electrons spiraling around magnetic field lines giving off uh, this kind of X-ray energy, but they just feel look like hot uh, gas clouds that have been blown away from the central region. Um, now, if we look at the X-ray image, you can see these very bright things here. Back to the radio, it's nothing. They're not there. Most of them aren't there. Um, there are bubbles here. It looks like a supernova or some kind of a, a ultraviolet light from a very massive star cluster maybe has blown a bubble into the area. Here's another bubble up here. Um, you can see that hot gas, but you don't see these kinds of things. Okay, now these, we believe, would be um, accretion disks around um, neutron stars or black holes. And um, those accretion disks are very hot in the X-ray, uh, and so they're uh, emitting high-energy X-rays. Uh, let's go back to the composite. And you can see that the radio waves don't necessarily line up with these. So there's several things going on here in this image. You have um, the energy produced by the radio, uh, the magnetic field in the center of the galaxy, which is producing the radio waves. And you have the very hot um, interject material directly produced by objects in the X-ray image. So uh, let me go back to this image and go to the next version. Again, note that the magnetic field lines are traced by these materials. Oh, this, by the way, was 
um, from the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa. Now we're going to look at this very linear structure. Um, let me go to this. See this structure outlined in red? G.7-.41. Uh, this looks like an area where you have two magnetic field lines. Remember the uh, magnetic field lines shaped by the Earth's magnetic field are these big loops you know, or in the sun. It looks like a couple of loops have interacted with each other. And it may have been formed when these magnetic fields aligned in different directions collided, became twisted around each other in a process called magnetic reconnection, similar to what happens during uh, uh, CMEs, uh, coronal mass ejections on the sun. This particular one is 20 light years long and only 0.2 light years wide. So the width is 1 one hundredth of the length. Well, what else do we see in this kind of a picture? The green circles here, these bright blobs, there's one here, there's another one here, um, seem to be uh, x-rays that are reflected by the dust around persistent x-ray sources. These are just continuous sources. They're neutron stars or black holes with accretion disks around them. And those accretion disks are being heated up by friction as they rotate very rapidly around these neutron stars or black holes. And that friction produces uh, x-ray sources. Um, so that's what those are. There is a molecular complex called Sagittarius C which is sort of here in uh, sort of outlined in purple. Uh, it's a huge molecular cloud. It contains a supernova remnant within it, as well as um, something called the Compton reflection continuum, um, production of X-rays by um, accelerated um, part charged particles um, and fluorescent lines, material that has been ionized in, and the electrons are recombining. Um, and giving off fluorescence. Um, and a lot of this is due to the reflection of past flare-ups of the supermassive black hole. Sagittarius A star is here. Here's the box for it with an arrow pointing right into the center. This is where the black hole is located. And so past flares from the black hole, um, that energy or light has gone out and is somewhat reflecting and bouncing around within Sagittarius C and making it show up. There's also a cold gas cloud uh, over to the left of Sagittarius A star here in purple. And uh, this is the one that was interesting. How can a cool atomic hydrogen H2 gas cloud exist in a region with all this warm and hot winds driven by supernova, the hydrodynamics of the central black hole, all of this going on without heating up and mixing into the hot gas? Well, there are 3D magnetohydrodynamic calculations that suggest that the threaded tangled magnetic fields can keep the cold gas intact and prevent its dissipation and over ionization. Now there are also these hot plumes up here above and below the central region of the galaxy. They extend 700 light years above and below the galactic plane. And they seem to be driven by supernova and strong magnetic field reconnections. Remember that was CMEs, coronal mass ejections from the sun again. Um, these magnetic reconnection events may play a major role in heating the gas that exists between the stars, what we call the interstellar medium. This process may also be responsible for accelerating particles to produce cosmic rays. We observe cosmic rays um, on the Earth uh, and their interaction in our atmosphere uh, and uh, also drive turbulence in the interstellar medium um, that might generate new generations of star formation. Let's look at a couple of these other things real quickly. Here in purple is the Arches Cluster. This is to the left and slightly above Sagittarius A star of the black hole. The Arches Cluster is the most dense open cluster in the galaxy. Now there are um, globular clusters which have hundreds of thousands of stars um, that are very dense scattered around, mostly around the outside of the galaxy. Um, this is an open cluster. These stars all form together from the same big gas cloud, but not in the kind of uh, condensed way of a, of a globular cluster. But it is, this, as an open cluster, it is the most dense open cluster in our galaxy. It's 25,000 light years from the Earth. 
100 light years from Sagittarius A star, so very close to Sagittarius A star. It has 135 young massive stars. Some of them are more than 100 times the mass of our own sun and then thousands of smaller stars. It's only two and a half million years old. Now remember, um, the archeologists found the remains of Lucy, this upright um, uh, walking uh, hominid um, in uh, Africa in uh, about two and a half million years ago, you know, about two and a half million years old. And uh, so when she was walking around in the plains of Africa, these stars were just beginning to form. Um, they uh, do emit brightly in the X-ray, the infrared and the radio, but the visible light is blocked by that, all that dust, so we can't see that. So let's take a, a look at something else here. Um, the quintuplet cluster. Okay, that's very close to the Arches cluster and this cold gas cloud to the left again of Sagittarius A star. The quintuplet cluster includes five extremely bright Wolf Rayette stars. And you can see how these stars emitting ultraviolet light have blown this material away from them. Um, this was material from this big, huge molecular cloud uh, from which these stars condensed and collapsed. You can see one doing it right here to the right, um, creating this spherical expansion of gas around it and in the center as well. Um, the um, quintuplet is a dense open cluster, uh, and again, 100 light years from Sagittarius A star. It has um, 21 Wolf Rayet stars, two luminous blue variables and a bunch of red supergiants, hundreds of smaller stars. It's about 4 million years old, twice as old as the previous cluster. Um, and again, it emits an X-ray, IR, and radio, but blocked in the visible. These Wolf Rayet stars are the evolved to expel all the hydrogen. They um, are a million times hotter than our sun. And so most of the radiation comes out in the ultraviolet. Ultraviolet radiation has a great deal of energy. It pushes against the material and it pushes away the outer envelope of the star and any nearby interstellar material to form these kinds of structures. Now we'll go back to this image on the Milky Way center again. Uh, and this time we're going to look at these DB objects. You see something up here called DB00-58, this is in purple, to uh, uh, sort of above Sagittarius A star. And then uh, there's DB06 down here to the lower left and a number of others. Uh, so we're gonna look at those. These are star clusters, clusters of young, bright red infrared stars, red stars that are um, radiating in the infrared. They cannot be seen in visible light. Um, this is a combination, these photographs are combinations of Chandra X-ray imaging and uh, blue are the hot X-rays, millions of degrees Kelvin, uh, combined with the, the infrared uh, image from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the hot X-ray gas may be due to collisions of stellar winds from closely orbiting um, giant stars. Um, DB, uh, well, these two bottom ones, 58 and 6, uh, show less uh, absor infrared absorption, X-ray absorption. So they're probably foreground objects. They're probably between the Earth and our solar system and the center of the galaxy, toward the center of the galaxy, but not directly in it. Whereas 1-42 uh, um, does not show that extinction. It probably is um, right in there, close to the center of our galaxy. Okay, so that was a little tour of the um, this new image that was uh, recently produced, combination of radio and X-ray um, data uh, toward the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And that ends my presentation. If anyone has questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Okay, thank you very much, Rick, for sharing that. You made the entire center of the Milky Way transparent by putting it in a different, uh, if by your explanation and by showing us in all these different wavelengths um, that you can see actually to the center. That's really fascinating. Um, so there's a chat window um, 
that you may, the chat bubble, please type your questions in um, for Rick at the bottom um, and I will relay them as they come in. So while we're waiting for questions, I do have a couple questions. One of them is um, you have um, the magnetar and you have a regular neutron star. Why do some neutron stars become magnetars with the really high magnetic field a thousand times more and some just become regular neutron stars? That is an excellent question. And I don't know. Um, from what I have read, that's still an active area of investigation. Um, people are not really sure. Now, there are some folks who will wave their hands and say, there is a natural variation of the strength of the magnetic field. The original stars that formed the neutron star are come from a wide variety of stars, right? Some are very massive. Uh, some are just a little more massive than our sun. Others are much more massive. Um, the um, characteristics of the supernova explosion itself uh, may be a little different in some cases than others. Uh, we know that this explosion is um, enhanced and maybe even made possible by an outflow of neutrinos uh, through very dense material near the center of this implosion. Uh, and that helps um, amplify the explosion into a supernova explosion. Um, <clears throat> are there some physical mechanisms uh, going on during the supernova explosion that differ between different stars? Or is it that the original star is formed from a, um, a gas cloud, a, a huge molecular cloud, which um, from which different stars form. We know that, that that's the way that's working. We see those uh, star formation uh, regions throughout uh, the Orion Nebula and other places, excuse me, in space. And so um, there may be magnetic fields entrained in these. Um, you know, remember we have these galactic magnetic fields and some of the very strong ones or stronger ones may be entrained in that material in the gas cloud before it collapses. As it collapses to a normal star, that star then has a stronger magnetic field than your average star. And then when that star becomes a supernova and the core collapses to a neutron star, that magnetic field is magnified even more so to become one of these magnetars with the super magnetic fields. And that's, that's one um, mechanism that one might think about, but um, we don't really know for sure. We need more data on these magnetars and and particularly where they were formed, how they were formed, what their precursor stars were, things like that. You could probably turn your video on too, Rick, so we could see you while you're talking. Yeah, okay. okay so we're, we we've got a few questions that have come in now. So Steve Becker asks, concerning meridional circulation in the sun, wouldn't mass pile up at the poles because of the circulation velocity difference? Yes, so you actually have a number of different um, phenomena that are happening there. You would think that this material is going toward the poles at 40 miles per hour, but only coming back at two to four miles per hour. Well, one thing you could do is um, you could have a fairly thin layer moving toward the pole and then the return layer being thicker so that that material does um, bunch up just as Steve uh, would uh, had mentioned. Um, and so you have a little thicker layer coming back at a slower velocity. So you still have the material, um, uh, but some of it may be absorbed into um, deeper layers of the sun. And what is left is coming back in a, as a thicker layer, uh, but moving at a slower velocity. Um, I don't know, Joyce, you know more about solar physics than I do. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I have not really studied meridional circulation. We tend to ignore it in our stellar models. The, and it's at an intermediate time scale, you know, between convection and evolution. So it's, it's right in there where if you have to ignore something and you want to look at convection, you ignore that. If you want to look at evolution, you ignore, you know, merid meridional circulation too. So I am not an, an expert at it, no. By far. If anyone, that, if anyone no. has a, a better explanation than I was able to come up with, um, feel free to type it into the chat and uh, let us know if you have a better idea. It's a really excellent question, Steve. Mm -hmm. It is. Meridional circulation is something that we don't, take, as I say, take into account very well, and we should do better a better job with it. I, it could cause a lot of mixing, I think, that we're not taking into account. Yeah. Um, 
Marilyn has a question. Can the polarity of the magnetic fields measured by Sophia in other galaxies be determined? Polarity. Yes. Um, yeah, it's actually the polarization that we see in the radio data. And so we can get polarity. Um, it's really interesting. If you think of a magnetic field going from a North Pole to a South Pole, um, the magnetic field lines on, on the Earth are actually emanating from the South and going to the North. So what we call the North Pole is because the North end of a magnet is attracted to the North Pole, which means that's the South Pole of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, so anyway, yes, uh, we, we can see something about the polarity. And in those galaxy pictures, uh, I don't know how easily I could uh, could bring one of those back up again. Uh, oh, I think I can. Hold on just a second. Let me uh, bring up some of these. So in these galaxy pictures, you can see that these magnetic field lines are going all sorts of different directions. Here's uh, a close up as well. Uh, or the, uh, maybe this one is even better. Um, and so, yes, the polarizations are flipped all sorts of different directions. Uh, and so uh, that's why this idea is that there are perhaps point-like disturbances uh, that are fueling these, the supernova explosions, infalling gas, magnetars, and so on, that are occurring with random um, polarizations within the galaxy, and that's causing the um, the gal galactic field uh, to look very disjoint. Yeah. So what's going on there with that blob at the, the the bottom right of that picture? There's kind of a detached section of polarity there. Do you, you know you mean, what I'm talking about? Is this well? Let's see. You mean down here? Go further down and further to down the here? left. Yeah, down there. What's going on down there? Yeah, so um, that's this is this interesting. There could be, first of all, something interfering here with the observation, uh -huh. so that we can't see it, and it yes. may be continuous. It's just it's like the the dust clouds interfering with visible light. Um, there may not be enough material to trace. Remember, uh, the way the radio telescope works is it's looking at the polarization of material that is entrained in the magnetic fields, basically electrons spiraling around the magnetic field lines, and there just may not be enough material to show mm -hmm. that up clearly. So that's one possible explanation. Another one is that uh, whatever is generating some of this stuff, um, these point sources, uh, there may be a number of them that are causing these um, um, asymmetry, asymmetries in the field because they're in the magnetic um, field lines from these different sources are interfering with each other. Uh, the way we saw in the picture of the center of the Milky Way, how some of those magnetic field lines can collide and produce all sorts of weird structures. They may interfere with each other um, in, uh, in such a way that we don't see a contin the continuity here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure, but I can think of a couple of possible. Yeah, well, it looks like it might be almost circulating around after you tell me that the center isn't very bright, but maybe there are some lines almost circulating around that dark mm -hmm. yeah. spot. Yeah. You seem to be these structures, mm -hmm. linear structures here, or yeah. uh, looping structures that are right. completed. That and are... the magnetic field lines may complete. There just may not be enough material there to trace those magnetic field lines uh, and uh, emit light needed by the radio telescope to yeah. see them. That makes a lot of sense. So we have another question from Jonathan. Um, he says, maybe I missed it, but do we have estimates of the diameter of Sagittarius A star? You mentioned a mass of 4 million solar masses, I think. Can you explain how we make that estimate? Yeah. Um, so what we do is we look at the stars that are orbiting um, the, uh, the black hole. I did not put that in my presentation. But um, you know, people have seen that in other presentations. I'll just go back to this one for a moment. So you have stars that orbit the black hole. In general, they don't get close enough to be um, entrained in the black hole, usually, or at least not later in the lifetime of the black hole. When the black hole and the galaxy were at a very early age, presumably there, were, there was a great deal of material um, that was entrapped and, and uh, uh, spiraled into the black hole, maybe providing jets and all sorts of things. 
um, but as it aged, it kind of ate up the material, and there's just nothing around it right now, uh, or very little around it that uh, that would fall into it. Uh, but there are stars orbiting the black hole, and we see these stars orbiting the black hole, and um, there are a large variety of stars, and from their spectra and the other information we can gather about those stars, we can get estimates of the types of stars uh, from the brightness and um, other aspects of those uh, those stars, you know, we have these things called HR diagrams uh, that are brightness, luminosity, uh, uh, mass relationships uh, that we have uh, normalized by looking at stars of certain spectral classes that are close enough to the Earth that we can actually see them move in the sky as the Earth orbits the sun. Um, and with that movement, we can determine geometrically how far away they are. So we know their distance, we know their brightness. Um, we know, uh, especially if they're in a binary system with another star, we can get their masses. So we can get an idea of, uh, given the spectral class of the star and what we observed, what that star's inherent brightness and mass is going to be. And so we look at those stars and those stars are orbiting the black hole and they're orbiting the black hole very, um, very, very close. The, the minimum orbit of those stars around the black hole um, is roughly the size of our solar system. Wow. So we can do two things. Given that we know the mass of those stars, we can look at the orbital dynamics of those stars orbiting the black hole. And there are a couple dozen of them. Um, so we can look at that, uh, get the orbital velocities, use Kepler's laws and other things to determine what the mass of the object is that they must be orbiting. Uh, that gives us this 4 million solar masses. And then there's a, uh, if you really wanted to know the diameter, uh, you could look up the equation. Um, I forget now, 2gm over r or something uh, for a uh, the event horizon, which is the sort of the, the surface of no return of a black hole. And it's dependent only on the mass of the black hole. So you plug in 4 million solar masses and you get a, a size for the event horizon of the black hole. Um, which is roughly the size of our solar system or, or so, um, depending on how you want to define our solar system. Um, but uh, yeah, the masses come from looking at the orbits of these stars that we're able to identify that are orbiting very closely around that black hole in the center. I'm glad you stopped on this picture of the spaghettification because I was wondering how long does it, does it take in real time for this to occur? How long were these observations? Did it take a day or a week or a five minutes for the star to get shredded like that? That's actually a really good question. And I don't remember that. Okay, I'm sure it's in the back. paper, um, yeah. but I just don't happen to remember that, that information. I don't, don't think, let me go to the next one. I don't think there's a, a scale. No, there isn't a time scale noted in the video, so I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it says 25 seconds, but that's just the length of the video or something. Oh yeah, that's just yeah. the length of this particular video. Yeah. It's not the actual time scale. No, yeah, I'll have right. to look that up. Yeah, that, that would be really, really interesting. Really interesting picture. So I'm still uh, looking for some more questions in the chat. I So please type some more in. Um, I had another question though about your DB um, clusters at the end. So right. you showed us um, you showed us that one cluster, the Arches cluster, which was very young, massive stars. And then you said these other DB clusters were you're seeing them in the infrared, um, and the and you're not seeing them in the same the same wavelengths as Arches here. Um, so are those also very the DB clusters? Are those also very young with massive hot stars, or are those older stars or are they still forming? Um, what's going on with the DB clusters? Okay. Can I yeah. make those? These, those are, are, these, yeah. are, these are young stars um, okay. and they're red stars. So um, a lot of the information uh, comes out in the infrared, which is why Hubble is able to see them. Now, those other clusters also, uh, all of these things um, emit in, uh, well, you see the diffuse X-rays in the blue uh, part of these images. Um, they emit in the infrared, and they, um, uh, but they do not emit, or we can't see them in the visible, uh, just simply because of the dust in the way. Um, but these clusters emit mostly in the infrared, 
Um, let's see if that's some of these other clusters. So the Wolf Rayette stars uh, emit mostly in the ultraviolet. So yeah. they're much hotter stars. They're more massive than our sun. They burn brighter, they're much hotter, um, and they emit in the infrared. Uh, so those are infrared um, emitting stars. These are more uh, red infrared emitting stars um, in the DB yellow. clusters. So that means... Yeah, the, the first ones are infrared and these are infrared as well? No, the first ones are ultraviolet, sorry. Ultraviolet, uh, the, yeah. the wolf stars are ultraviolet, the first clusters. Oh, this, um, this one may be then uh, lower mass stars, right? Yes, so these that would are, presumably be lower mass stars. Still forming, maybe still forming? Still forming, oh yes, in both of these clusters, they're still forming. The problem okay. is, um, as the you get some these a certain number of stars forming, they're emitting radiation even if it's in the infrared and blowing the dust away that kind of uh, slows down the star formation rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so these will be doing that to some extent, but not to the extent of the Wolf Rayette stars. Remember those things. Ah, my computer's going nuts here. Um, these things really strongly. That ultraviolet light is so. Um, energetic, it really blows the gas away and mm -hmm. stops the star formation. Yeah, so this kind of goes to the question of why do some clusters form a bunch of low mass stars and don't have any Wolf Rayet stars? And these, these other clusters with the high mass stars, they look like they've blown away their interstellar environment so that there aren't any low, they've stopped the star formation. So, yeah, but even, right, okay. that's right. But even in these clusters, there are hundreds of smaller stars. Uh -huh. that we just okay. can't see them at this scale because they're uh, overpowered by the light and radiation from the brighter stars. Okay. Okay. If you go to these, it looks like a lot of low mass stars. Yeah, it's not much big bright ones, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, not many bright ones. Yeah, okay. All right, any other questions for Rick? I've dominated the question that so many. Yeah. This really a, a grand tour of everything in the in the Milky Way and beyond. So it's very right. great. And I really like the Chandra picture. That that must you said that just came out. Uh, yes, the okay. combined picture. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, okay. it just came out. I think it was in May, the end of May, something like that. That is really impressive. Is it also labeled with all these objects or did you do that? Uh, the uh, original um, website for Chandra uh, has the labels. If we go okay. back to that uh, website real quick, um, it shows, um, scroll down, at the bottom you can look at either the radio image yeah. or the x-ray image or the composite image where they're overlaid. And now if I take my um, my little mouse pointer and point up, it gives me the uh, descriptions. Right, so why don't they have an infrared image on top of that as well? Oh, that's a good question, they could. Uh, maybe they just felt it was too confusing, um, but, uh, or maybe that's a different group that does infrared than the group. It probably do. is, but I won't, that's what I was wanting to see is the infrared overlaid on that. Yeah, yeah that would be interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, there you go. You need to uh, propose a, a Hubble. Well, yeah, propose a Hubble uh, activity to to look at the same region that they looked at here, and then overlay that data on it. They must have it because you were showing me pictures toward the center of the galaxy within the infrared. They do, but the the thing that makes this unique is the extent. Most mm -hmm. of those Hubble images that I was showing are um, or the infrared images. They're, they're much smaller subsets of this image. Okay. This is the first image that has gone 700 light years above the plane of the galaxy and 700 light years below the plane of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. and that was generated, uh, I think, by the fact that uh, they can now see this in the radio um, because of the sensitivity of the Meerkat array and the way it operates. They're able to get this extensive uh, area above and below, and so they use Chandra to try to get uh, the X-ray image above and below the galaxy as well, and so mm -hmm. that's what I think the impetus to try to get this image was, and they hadn't had that uh, range previously. They were only looking at smaller subsets of these images, and so some of the Hubble things that I showed uh, really zoom in, like I think the uh, the DB clusters 
that you see these little tiny bright spots. Here's DB58 here. Um, and if we go to the, the uh, DB cluster images, yeah, this is Chandra and uh, Hubble. And now you're looking at a tiny, tiny, tiny subset of that big wide field image. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, so that explains it, right? Wow, well, there's more images they can they can make and more to learn. There you go. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I don't think I see any other questions. So last call here. Um, well, those have been some tough questions. So yeah, John Jonathan wrote something else. Also, he says I wanted to share an art project idea I've been working on to build a sculpture that points at the center of the galaxy to raise awareness of this amazing thing. Maybe you can share it with Rick. Um, so in the chat, he has a galacticobservatory.com is his website, and I will try to save the chat for if I can do this, um, and I'll make sure that I can, I pass that on to, to Rick, but it looks like it's all one word, galacticobservatory.com. Okay. Where he's trying to make an art sculpture of uh, the center of the galaxy. That would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you said pointing to the center of the galaxy. That's yeah. tricky because the Earth's rotating, and so I don't know how you do that, but, uh, but it certainly could yeah. do something representing the center of the galaxy. Yeah. That would be very interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can find that. Okay, great. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. All right, so um, next week, we have a, a live planetarium show about the night sky in August, and it is Friday, August the 13th, and it will be done by um, Steve Becker and Kelly Housley in the Peak uh, Planetarium. So if you're up for a live show at seven o'clock, um, don't miss that one, it should be good. And then don't forget to watch the Perseids. You can probably see some even before or after the date, the um, April, August 11, 12th. I read that there are people spotting them even now, um, you know, just at a low, much lower rate. But take advantage of any dark, any clear skies you have in this monsoon season and go out and take a look for a few minutes. You might spot one. So, okay, any other announcements, Rick? That's yeah. good for me. Okay. All right. Great. So thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you again next time. Okay. Have a good evening. Okay. okay bye, -bye. Thanks. bye. Bye.